Hello, welcome to Youth Partnership in Action to Change Tomorrow, or better known as Youth Pact 2022, proudly brought to you by Taylor's College and MIDP. My name is Amelia Sharif, and it is my absolute pleasure to be your host today. Let's be honest, to say that we have had a rough two years would be an understatement. We have had to face massive health and economic crisis, arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. We also had to endure political instability from Lanka Sheraton, hashtag we will not forget, to parliament not being in session for the longest time, to Speaker of the Dewan not allowing MPs to discuss the floods, although people are literally suffering. And all of this just goes to show that it has been heartbreaking and disappointing. Talking about the floods, I would like us to take a moment to remember those who have lost their homes, those who are still in evacuation centers, as well as the lives lost. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Youth Pact. I remember the first meeting we had, and by we, I mean Taylor's College and MIDP. We sat down and we asked ourselves, what can we do to show our support to the brilliant young advocates that we have? What can we do to platform and celebrate their work, their passion, their values, their principles, and most importantly, all that they have done and will continue to do to fight for a better Malaysia? And that was how Youth Pact was born. Youth Pact aims to bring young Malaysians together with youth leaders and change makers to encourage action. We have manifesto and mentorship sessions, as well as a forum and capacity building workshops that you do not want to miss. In an effort to be more inclusive and diverse, 
every youth pack session will be translated into Bahasa Isyarat Malaysia, BIM, live, so that the deaf community can also take part and contribute to the conversations. We also have enabled live captions at the bottom for those of you who need it. If you don't want to use the live caption function, you can turn it off at the bottom bar or in your settings. To that end, I just want to recognize uh, Madam Lucy Lim, who's here with me today, and Mr. Jonah Ong, that you'll probably see later, um, for, you know, for helping out and, you know, for agreeing to be our BIM translators, and they'll be right uh, with us throughout the entire event for, um, in the next um, in the next, for today and, and tomorrow. Um, I also would like to take this opportunity to thank um, Lucy and Jonah for helping us. If any of you are organizing events and forums, do reach out to these wonderful people um, so that you can also get BIM translation services for your events. Before we start the show, some house rules for everyone. For those of you on Zoom, please keep your cameras um, off at all times and stay muted. Uh, we have disabled you from um, um, unmuting yourself. So if you have something to say, if you have a comment, if you would like to ask any questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box that we have here. We are keeping an eye on. Um, if you are watching on Facebook, um, on MIDP Facebook or on Taylor's College Facebook or on any of our partners and speakers Facebook, um, you can also put your comments or question in the comment function. Um, we will also try to keep an eye there and we will pass your questions to the moderator as they come along. All right, so now that that's out of the way, I would like to now take this opportunity to thank Taylor's College. Youth Pact would not be possible without the amazing partnership and hard work from Taylor's College. If you have been to any of MIDP's events, you would have heard me saying this, and I will say this again. I am eternally grateful for the support from Taylor's College, not just you know, for being one of the leading private colleges in the world, but also for being so cool to work with and so passionate about youth empowerment and soft skills education. We are truly grateful to be able to work closely with Taylor's College um, for the past years. On that note, I would like to invite Dr. Siva Bala Naidu, the head of School of Pre-University Studies, a friend of mine and an overall awesome human being to say a few words to welcome everyone and officially launch Youth Pact 2022. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Emile Sharif, my good friend, the CEO of Malaysian Institute for Debate and Public Speaking, for that warm introduction and for the word awesome. Thank you very much. And good morning to everyone else and Happy New Year to all of you who are here present virtually, particularly the distinguished speakers of our special event, Youth Pact 2022, or more elaborately known as Youth Partnership in Action to change tomorrow. The arguments that we may have heard in the past that our youth are not interested in politics or are apathetic towards the social issues that affect them certainly is not the case nowadays. In fact, my observation is that our youth are not really politically attuned, perhaps even more attuned than many seniors like me, but are also deeply interest, interested in the current state of affairs of the country. At the same time, many have also been vocal in matters related to nation building and have established channels where their voices can be heard. I must add that the rise of social movements over the last decade has certainly provided fertile platforms and opportunities for our youth to voice out and contribute to Malaysia's social and economic development. It is in the same spirit and philosophy that we, Taylor's College and MIDP, have conceptualized and curated this special event for youth, by youth, which we have labeled as Youth Pact or Youth Partnership in Action to Change Tomorrow. It is our vision that this inaugural event will provide a safe space for intellectual discussions and discourse. Ladies and gentlemen, 
28% of Malaysia's population are made up of youth. Therefore, in such demographic realities, our youth hold an enormous potential for change and positive action in relation to this, I must add that the potential of our youth is also tapped and nourished in Taylor's sphere, a holistic learning ecosystem which strives to provide Taylor's students and the community around us a unique experience to gear them for their productive place in the wider world. Thus, our involvement in Youth Pack 2022 resonates with the ethos that governs Taylor's sphere. In short, this event, this event today sets to create an environment where youth are free to express their individuality and opinions on critical nation building issues while connecting them to youth leaders and change makers to inspire further action. Despite the positivity that has been seen among youth in terms of the involvement and indulgence in politics and social economic issues, there are still naysayers who often criticize our young people for their opinions and worldview too often when youth voice out their concern and the challenges they face, their labor lama. Tidak bersyukur, hanya reti merungut, which literally means lama weak, tidak bersyukur, ungrateful, hanya reti merungut, always whining. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for these narratives to stop. Let us embrace an open mindset and believe in our young people. Trust me, they have what it takes to tackle bold and contentious matters, to contribute to social and economic development, to put forth ideas that will make the nation a better place for all. Let's together allow our youth to be imaginative, curious, and innovative. In fact, I believe that the cliche that defines the youth as future leaders should be debunked and made a kick. Let us start recognizing them as current leaders and ensure their participation and inclusion in nation building. Let's offer our youth a seat at the main table. With that same conviction, I'd like to urge all the youth participating in this event to make your voices heard. Remember that this is your forum and you will lead and breathe life in to it, you shall inspire innovative ideas and aspirations for the future. You shall be open, inclusive, and democratic. Your participation in this forum should stand out as a symbol of your unwavering commitment to build a better Malaysia for all. Together, you will do great things, and you can count on us to support you. Thank you for listening and giving me the opportunity to officially launch Youth Pack 2020. Wishing you all a successful event. Thank you. Malaysia amended the federal constitution to lower the voting age from 21 to 18. Where do we stand as the youth of Malaysia? Malaysia's education system has grown so segregated where many of our generation grew up without having the chance to interact and learn with those different from us. They say that the youths are the future leaders, but I say youths are the current leaders. I just want schools to be safe. We envision a Malaysia where the youth are able to navigate differences and have the knowledge and skills needed to live, collaborate and work with people of different kinds. Who are we? We make up 28% of Malaysia's population. We care about what's happening around us. I hope you realize that, that in each of us, and that itself is the, is the greatest thing that you can do for the world, is to realize your own potential. And we want change. In this two-day online event, join youths across the nation. Participate in impactful conversations. Let your voice be heard. So it's a small thing. So I think when we talk about wanting to create change, it is important to break down what change means. Be part of the future. The future is bright for one reason only, because you will grow up and you will be our future. 
Join the Youth Pack now. Thank you so much, Dr. Siva, for that speech. I could not have said it better myself. And also thank you for officially launching the inaugural Youth Pact 2022. Now, let's hear a little bit about MIDP, but instead of talking, uh, listening to me talk about it, um, instead, how about you listen or hear from our youngest and brightest about MIDP, why they join us and the amazing work that we do. Please enjoy. Are you guys ready for some questions? Yeah! Why is eye contact very important? Yes. Eye contact is very important because you know why? I give you a, uh, an example. When you are talking to somebody, you look at the wall. It means that you are talking to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> why are hand gestures? To interact with the audience, so they make, it, it makes them feel like they're connected with you. Why is it important for people to feel connected? <laughs> okay, oh. it's important oh. to feel connected with people because, like, if you're not feeling connected to a person, the person will be like, I don't get what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, but why do you think emotions are important? Emotions are very important because, so for example, if you are saying a story. And you say it's supposed to be a sad story, but then you say like this. One to ball a car, one to a car accident, a three man died, one one because he got killed by the wolf. People also like, why ya? Yeah? Look at Spinkle, uh, slow loose so nice. because, because they don't feel what you are talking about. Actually, speaking of competitions, all of you are actually national champions or amazing finalists. But were you always this articulate and confident with yourself? Uh, well, I was not that brave at first, but I had a bite. My mind kept on saying, just chill, chill, just chill, and speak. <laughs> so I, I did it with a positive mindset and I did my story perfectly. I was never this brave and I'm still a little bit shy. But last time before I joined in my DP, I was really shy and I wasn't very good at socializing. This one time when I was out with my friend and his and his father, we were lining up to go to a restaurant and then we saw this kid playing some game. After me and my friend started talking about it, then my friend's father said, Why don't you ask him what game he's playing? Then I said, But isn't that weird? Then, then his father said, no, it's good to socialize. So me and my friend went over to talk to that kid. It was going really well. Then after that, it started getting really awkward. Then the kid said, um, can you guys leave me alone? <laughs> <laughs> so why did you all decide to join MIDP? I joined MIDP because I want to further improve all my soft skills, in the personal skills, and the technology skills. I know MIDP is the perfect place for me to unleash my talents, a place where I can learn and get better every day. I joined MIDP because actually I didn't know, I wasn't interested in public speaking or anything like that. But then my parents said, I talk a lot, so they asked me to join public speaking. So when I joined public speaking, it was actually really fun and not at, at all how I expected it. And then after a while, I actually started enjoying MIDP and started wanting to go there every day. Oh, oh, that's so good. I learned, I joined MIDB because I want to enhance my soft skills. I enjoy socializing with people, so MIDB is definitely the best place for me to express my feelings, my thoughts, and share my ideas with like my good friends. Aren't they adorable? I have watched that videos that video like thousands of times and I must say it put a smile on my face every single time. So anyway, in the next two days, we hope to mainstream and bring to the limelight the opinions, perspectives and lived experiences of our youth on pressing issues facing our generation while debunking the myth that our youth are uninterested or incapable of providing meaningful contributions to nation building issues across the political, economic and social spectrum. 
Um, but kicking things off today will be the Youth Manifesto session, which is a platform for respected youth leaders to share their hopes and demands for the changes they want to see on a variety of subjects. Um, they will also be talking about initiatives or campaigns that they are promoting to make Malaysia a better place. I don't know for sure, which is why you'll have to stay tuned and listen to them after this. We have some awesome youth change makers with us today. People I personally admire, people, people whose work we have been a fan of, and I cannot wait for you to meet them all. Some of the topics that will be covered include diversity, um, education, gender equality, disability, and climate justice. Without further ado, I would like to invite um, or introduce you to the esteemed moderator for the Youth Manifesto session. It is none other than Mahira Marzuki, the program coordinator for from Undi Sabah. Hi, Hi my oh Jinx, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um. Thanks. Um. Thanks for passing the floor to me, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Because I'm also super, super excited to be, um, you know, moderating this session as well as to listen to our stellar speakers for today. Um. Hi, everyone. As um, M has spoken and introduced. Uh, me just now. My name is Mahira. I'm one of the co-founder as well as co-coordinator of Undi Saba. Um. Welcome to Youth Pack 2022. Um. Before. It's going to be a two-day event, um, as M has mentioned, where we will invite speakers from various backgrounds. And it's something I also want to attend, like even the workshops that I'm also super excited to join. So for more information, you can definitely head on to the MIDP Instagram page. Um, so yeah, so that's all. Um, friends and viewers out there, before we enlighten ourselves with the topic today, let us get to know our stellar panelists for today. Um, joining me today are five brilliant speakers. First, we have Jason Wee. Um, he is the co-founder of AOD Malaysia. Jason Wee is the co-founder of Architects of Diversity Malaysia, a nonprofit that aims to bridge communities and identity groups among youth for justice, peace, and a sustainable future. Since 2018, AOD has partnered with various local and international organizations to design and execute opportunities for intergroup contact. He is a graduate of the Social and Public and International Affairs with a focus in race, ethnicity, and discrimination at Princeton University. Say hi, Jason. Hi, Mahira. Thank you so much for having me today. Right. Glad to have you here. Next, we have Cheryl Ann Fernando, which is the Chief Executive Officer of Pemimpin. Cheryl was appointed to the National Education Policy Review Committee formed by the Ministry of Education in 2019. She formerly served as the Director of Education and Learning at EduNation Malaysia, a nonprofit organization focused on creating online videos to help Malaysian students excel in their studies. Previously, Cheryl served as a Teach for Malaysia Fellow for three years, where she taught English in a rural school in Sungai Petani Kedah. Prior to Teach for Malaysia, she worked as a public relations consultant for four years. Cheryl graduated with a degree in mass communications and a master's in management. She also holds a postgraduate diploma in education. Glad to have you here, Cheryl. Say hi. Hi everyone, so happy to be here today. Right, next on we have Anis Barin. Um, she is the founder of Dear Her, Dear Her. She is currently a civil litigation lawyer. She has experience doing dispute resolution work in a wide range of practice areas. In 2018, she founded Dear Her, a youth-led women empowerment organization focusing on the issues of sexual harassment and violence against women. Dear Her has organized a number of activities throughout the years. A major project by Dear Her is Chakna Siswa, which aims to make university and college campuses safer via policy and campaigns. Apart from Dear Her, Anis has also participated in other initiatives for the youth, such as Parliament Digital Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative and the Kuala Lumpur Summit 2019. Her hope for the future is to create more progress for women's rights and safety. Hi, Anis. Hi, Mahira. Thank you so much for the invite. Truly honored to be here. Uh, glad to have you here. 
Um, next, we have Muhammad Nasrul um, from Disabled Social. Uh, whom is a disabled social activist um, at Bole Space. Nasrul is an activist and advocate representing persons with disabilities at Bole Space, currently pursuing master's degree in sociology and anthropology. Say hi, uh, Nasrul. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today. I'm glad to have you here. Last but not least, we have Heng Kya Chun um, from Greenpeace Malaysia. Heng is an advocate for strengthening civil society engagement in environmental issues. Heng was involved in imported plastic waste investigations in Malaysia from 2018 to 2020. Currently, he is focusing on the haze and forest fires campaign. So say hi. Yep. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for having me and nice to meet you all here. Uh, glad to have you on board as well. So that's all of our speakers for today. And I'm super, super excited to listen to them. So it's going to be a chill session, everyone. But before I invite the first speaker, I'd like to remind everyone that if you have any questions um, just throughout the session, you can definitely drop your um, questions down at the chat box and we can ask it later after the session, uh, their presentation ends. Um, so our first speaker for today, is Jason Wee, who's going to present his topic on Beyond Cloaga Malaysia. So, um, Jason, I'll pass the floor to you. All right, good evening. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for having me once again. Uh, my name is Jason, co-founder of Architects Diversity. At our organization, uh, we empower youth as multicultural leaders for the future, as well as build inclusive structures for in uh, democracies. Uh, this morning, I kind of, you know, since the topic is really about Apalagi Biliamahu, and I want to talk about diversity, obviously, as is in within our organization name, but also going beyond what our current events have articulated, which is really this beyond Kalago uh, Malaysia, where it's articulated by a current prime minister, um, and what really is needed to forward the cause of diversity in Malaysia. Now, we know that diversity is really the center stage in Malaysian politics, especially when it comes to race and religion. It has permeated every single corner of our society, even since pre-colonial times, uh, throughout every single do domain. However, diversity, you know, as its topic, as a topic of its own, is a huge white elephant in the room. There's segregation and self-segregation. Um, obviously, there's also discrimination in education, and we know it's getting worse. And we know in Architects University, we ran a uh, survey where we found that more youth experience discrimination in education compared to their older peers. So we know the issue is getting worse to some extent. Uh, and I'm not going to go deep into exactly the issue today. But I'm going to talk a bit more about how do we properly manage diversity as a country and more specifically as an administrative thought process. Throughout our time in Malaysia and our history, we have had multiple iterations or campaigns or attempts to build some sort of superordinate identity for all Malaysians. That means an identity that all of us can append to, can identify with in order to kind of bridge the gaps between our various racial and religious groups. Early on, we had obviously Wawa Sem 2020. Um, as you know, this was introduced by Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. Um, and this was seeded into almost every single aspect of our collective memory. Um, if you grew up, you know, some, if you were, you know, most people, most of us would have grown up reading about Wawa Sem 2020 in our textbooks and definitely have seen a lot of campaigns throughout maybe our primary school life or even before that. Um, talking about what was in 2020. After that, we had Satu Malaysia, which was under the purview of Prime Minister Najib Razak. If you grew up in the 2010s, uh, you probably remember this quite well, where we have various campaigns uh, and various strong imagery of the United Malaysia, oftentimes portraying Malaysians of different racial backgrounds coming together uh, in their traditional costumes and waving this uh, being collected under the Jalo Gemilang. Right now, Obviously, we have our iteration of Logo Malaysia, uh, where the direction is still being laid down, but oftentimes it's also borrowing elements from One Malaysia as well as Wawasan 2020 
uh, especially building a collective identity surrounding the challenges faced by Malaysia. Intrinsically, you know, we know these campaigns run parallel to a different storyline that tells a more segregated story. While most administrators and most people running the country want to portray a um, united Malaysia, these campaigns, we you know, are often not directly addressing the kind of issues that still contribute to how we are not interacting in positive ways with one another and how most Malaysians or many Malaysians of minority or different groups don't have access to the same kind of resources and ownership of the country as we would like them to be. Moving forward, what I want to highlight in my short time um, is for Apalagi Belia Mahu is how do we make sure that these campaigns and whatever form of diversity management packs a punch? In other words, how do we make sure that diversity is protected, um, that it produces campaigns that have failed to address the deep, the deep seated kind of issues that we've seen throughout Malaysia's history? The first thing I wanna say is whatever campaign, uh, whatever management of diversity needs to counter exclusionary narratives. While preaching inclusive narratives is important like what we've seen in these campaigns, these campaigns have not uh, counter exclusive narratives that have punished or, or have labeled a group not fully belonging to Malaysia or not fully uh, um, possessing the same rights or same ownership in the country. But these kinds of narratives fuel segregation. They fuel discrimination and negative intergroup interactions. Uh, in one of our AOD initiatives, Kami Nampa, where we monitor the Malacca elections for race and region part, we found that obviously, uh, I mean, no surprise that many politicians are still using the race and religion part to appeal to demographics to vote for a particular party based on racial or religious reasons. Now, although you know these these things have been going on, we first also need to acknowledge that these are the main drivers of polarization and rejection of a multicultural democracy. How do we disincentivize these exclusionary narratives? It must start strongly from a campaign that rejects these kinds of exclusionary narratives. While most of these campaigns before have built a you know, inclusive picture, they also need to address the counterpart of inclusive narratives, which are exclusionary na narratives in its efforts. But that also has to do with restructuring social pictures. Now, we know that the vernacular school debate has raged on and on. And we know that when it comes to managing diversity, a huge part of that stems from our education system and how we interact with one another and what kinds of spaces we share with peers from different groups. But the vernacular school debate hasn't gone anywhere productive in the past few decades. I would suggest that in order for us to move forward in this question, our question must be, how do we make our national institutions for all Malaysians again? How do we make our national institutions more inclusive? Because most of our institutions have been built around structures of colonial natures, as well as the impact of the new economic policy or NEP, the demand surrounding it in the 1970s. So 50 years on from the NEP, um, how do we even start to begin understanding the impact of NEP policies on diversity? These effects go largely understudied uh, where what we found that in, in our campaign for Skola Sumo, which is our anti-discrimination campaign in education, uh, many individuals still feel uh, discriminated within the schools where a lot of non uh, Bumi Putras uh, feel that they don't have the same kind of access or they feel discriminated within the space. Now, a lot of times when we talk about self-segregation, many, many of these, um, these behaviors do stem from how people perceive or whether a national institution is inclusive or not. So rather than forcing these people back into national institutions, how do we make sure our schools, our colleges, our workplaces are attractive enough for, and inclusive enough for different groups to come together again? The third thing and the last thing I wanna say um, in my short time is we need free speech for national reconciliation. Now managing diversity, I think in the past decades uh, cannot, uh, has gone hand in hand with repressing speech and discussion that are deemed too sensitive uh, to discuss, where many youth uh, are feel scared or don't have the opportunities to engage in conversations like about the May 15 riots, about NEP, and about various uh, events that have occurred throughout Malaysian history uh, in a safe and structured space uh, because of a lot of seditious laws, sedition laws that have permeated and 
created a chilling effect throughout our community. But the question is, beyond Kulaga Malaysia, how do we engage individuals to fully uh, understand, to participate in this dialogue uh, of not fearing repercussions of their opinions and to make sure that public spaces are accommodating of diverse opinions is also to make sure that we have this form of free speech for national reconciliation so that we understand the grievances and demands of other parties. Because at the moment, individuals don't feel safe in expressing what they truly believe in, and they don't feel that they are able to engage with their peers of different backgrounds, that's the moment where we will not receive or we will not achieve the kind of national reconciliation that is needed to protect and ensure that diversity thrives in Malaysia, uh, that, um, that is inclusive of all voices. Uh, but my seven minutes is up, but I'll hand it back the floor to you, Mahira. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for that um, presentation. Um, but I do have a follow-up question because um, I think you, you've mentioned how the government sometimes gloss over deep-seated issues and for it to be ignored this long, there are obviously hindrances as well, like our speeches, like what you've mentioned, aren't exactly free due to law and it becomes difficult for us, then how do, how do we navigate around those difficult conversations? Like how do we start as an individual in moving towards, you know, that the, the the goal that you've mentioned yeah thanks Mahira. that's a great question because you know i've been in many forums like this right when we're talking about these kinds of issues oftentimes in english um and i think though while these pockets of conversations are great and important to keep the discourse alive uh we need to take it to the classrooms because that's where the majority of malaysians begin to understand national issues begin to form their identity surrounding how, what the country means to them, right? So bringing it to the classroom requires a, some a courage from the administrative standpoint to embrace these conversations rather than to the side. Uh, but I think beyond that, um, we also need to have these conversations in uh, BM and all other vernaculars, because I think the discourse is thriving in English, but the level of understanding and you know, engagement that happens in other languages is very much lacking. And so I think a, ch a huge challenge for youth moving forward in the political sphere is to make sure that, you know, these, that we address the conversations that go on even in non-popular spaces. That means even in the, in, obviously in rural areas, obviously in spaces that oftentimes don't even have these conversations, right? Uh, that these spaces feel comfortable enough to e even initiate it on their own. And obviously, we, all of us here are, you know, we need to protect these spaces, but we also need to think about policies that incentivize and uh, facilitate these conversations uh, naturally. All right, thank you. That's a great input, Jason. Um, thank you so much um, for your presentation. And I do feel that our next uh, presenter um, could also like add more context as well as probably a much richer perspective um, as well when it comes to the angle of education. So next, I'd like we have Cheryl and Fernando will be presenting on a topic which is extremely important in Malaysia, as well as something that I do hold dear as well. It's about um, education in inequity in Malaysia. Uh, I'll pass the floor to you, Cheryl. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Mahira. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with a bit of introduction. So I've worked in education for more than 12 years. And what I do now is I work with school leaders and teacher leaders uh, to help improve their skills and how they can then work on improving their schools. Uh, like I said just now, uh, I was a Teach for Malaysia alumni as well. So, um, so, uh, I think today I want to share a bit about what are some of the systemic issues that leads to inequity in education. And I think for me personally, uh, if I can share like an anecdote, right? I never realized how um, unfair our education system was until I started teaching. And when I was teaching, I was posted to Kedah. And Kedah is not a very rural school or it's not a very pedalaman school. But what I found at that time was that um, a lot of um, my students, even at Form 1 and Form, uh, form 2, could not read and write. 
and up to form five, a lot of them still struggled with basic literacy. And I asked myself this, how is this even fair that the students that were coming to school at 15 and 16 cannot read? Who has failed them along the way? And I think this led to, you know, just me thinking a lot about education and thinking about what else can we do now to solve these very deep systemic issues that are happening within the system. So if you look at our education system, we are overseen by the Ministry of Education. And although, the, although education is the responsibility of the government, every state and federal territory and education department, they coordinate educational matters in their territory. So at the federal level is all the policy settings and the macro planning. The states do the delivery planning. And finally, the districts, they support the implementation of programs in school. But because of the way the system is made, it also makes change very difficult. So for example, if you want to bring an intervention to school, or if you want to suggest change, you have to go through all these levels before it is accepted. So there's no way, I think for those of you who have worked in school, you cannot just go to a school and offer a program unless the school leader is very empowered and the school leader wants to do something different in their school. That's the only way it's going to happen. If not, you will have to go back to the district and the state and finally federal. And it's the same with policy. So um, a lot of times people say, okay, if you know literacy is an issue, if I know that students are illiterate even at secondary schools, then why can't we do something about it? Why can't we have a policy in place to address this? But because of the way the system is, they measure literacy with enrollment rates. So as long as the student is enrolled in school, they are considered literate. So with that data, we have like almost 98% literacy in Malaysia. So the federal doesn't have the data to show that actually we have students who are illiterate. And if there is no data on this, then they will not make a policy decision on this. And our students will continue to be left behind. And it's the same at each level, they have a lot of reporting, right? So the district, the school needs to report to the district, the district reports to the state and the state then reports to the federal. And with any reporting comes a lot of KPIs. So the schools then have to uh, present like a very a good KPIs, right? And if they don't, then they are subject to questioning by the district, state and federal. And because of all of this, it makes it it's very difficult to push through or to suggest or to implement any big policy changes in the system, but not impossible. Um, so some of the facts, we know that our government, our, edu our spending on education is among the highest if we compare with other countries. Malaysia is one of the highest in education, still remain even though this data is 2013. Until today, if you look at our Blanjawan, we still spend the most for education. Uh, Malaysian school enrollment is very high. So like I said just now, uh, because we measure literacy with enrollment, so if our enrollment is high, that means our literacy is high as well. And uh, we don't have any true data to show us whether our students are literate or not in school. But this is good. It's good that our enrollment is high. Our preschool enrollment is at 80 plus percent, I think if I'm not mistaken, which is not great, but it's something that the government is working on to continuously improve. Um, and, but what are the, the issues in the education system? And I took this from Teach for Malaysia. So we know that one out of five Malaysian children do not complete their secondary school education. Uh, and I've seen this in the school that I was teaching, usually by form three, the students feel like they, they want to drop out and they want to um, start working. A lot of times schools, school doesn't make sense for them. If you continue to be illiterate or if you continue to struggle with literacy, you would find it very meaningless and uh, they drop out. 44% of our 14-year-olds do not meet the minimum international proficiency in reading. Uh, we know that there is a 3.1 years learning gap for the average Malaysian students and a 3.4 million difference in the average income if they have SPM, if they don't have SPM and are from a degree. So we know that all of these are very um, 
deep systemic issues that are still occurring in our education system. So, um, no, uh, like I said just now, right, there's no magic bullet because a lot of these problems are what we call very wicked problems, right? So it's very deep set, it's very inbuilt in the system. But what are some of the things that not just Pemimpin GSL, but all the other uh, non-profits, education non-profits out there are trying to do to solve these issues. I think number one is we know the quality of our education system cannot be better than the quality of our teachers. So for us at Pemimpin, we continue to work on training our teachers because it's very simple. When the in classroom instructions improve, then we can see a change in our education system. So like leads to my point number two, improving classroom instructions is key. So teachers teaching better, teachers are able to focus better on their teaching, uh, on their tugas hakiki, right? On their core business of teaching and not administrative tasks. Um, we work with school leaders. We know school leaders are key drivers and a good school leader can improve the school by 25%. So how can we work with school leaders to build their skills and their knowledge and their motivation to improve their schools? Uh, uplifting the teacher profession, getting more young professionals, getting uh, people who are, are getting people interested in the teaching profession. And finally, building school leaders as community leaders. So a lot of what we do at Pemimpin is helping school leaders to look at their role, not just as an administrative role, but how can I be a community leader and how can I really make a difference in my school and the community that I'm in? Um, uh, okay, so uh, I will, I want to like speak for my last two minutes on the Jautan Kuasa Kajian Dasar Pendidikan Negara, but a disclaimer, since the government has changed, whatever we have written in the Jautan Kuasa has been shelved for now, but I hope I'm optimistic that maybe one day it will come back, right? So uh, among the things that we put together in the Jautan Kuasa at that time was a new education model where TVET is taught at every level and students are free to pick subjects of choice depending on their interests. So what we found in our education system is something, it has not changed, right, for many years from the time I was in school to the time you were in school, perhaps from the time that my parents were in school. But how can we now ensure that our system is more holistic where students are not forced to pick between science stream and art stream or just you know, put into that mold, but they are free to pick subjects depending on their interests and they're also taught TVET at an early age. Um, and also during this time um, in the Jautan Kwasa, it gave me an opportunity to really study the education policies and understand how the ministry works. And I realized at that time, so when, whenever I was a teacher, right, I used to get very frustrated and I told myself, okay, if I can change the policy, I'm going to change it immediately, right? But when I was there, I realized that it wasn't so straightforward and they had so many um, uh, stakeholders that were involved in this that they needed to answer to before they would change a policy. But I think um, uh, these are my two kids, right? And whenever I'm working on with our schools and whenever I'm working with uh, like the schools all around Malaysia and for now, Pemimpin, we have worked with over 200 schools and this year, another 100. I continue to think about my own children, right? And for me, it's personal, right? Will, will my kids be able to walk into any government school in Malaysia and get an excellent education? And I think because it's personal, you know, because I, I want things to change, right? It becomes that much more important for me. So thank you so much. And please ask questions in the chat. And I saw someone said, I'm a Taylor's alumni. Yes, I am. I'm also a Taylor's uh, alumni. So thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Cheryl, for that presentation. Um, obviously, um, as what we've um, heard, um, we spend a lot, um, we spend the most in Malaysia and enrollment is high. However, there are still um, problems within the system as well. Um, and as what Cheryl has mentioned, change is not straightforward. Um, just to recap what um, she has mentioned, the quality of our education system um, cannot be better than the quality of teachers and improving classroom instructions is key in improving the system. Building school leaders, uh, we have to build school leaders as community leaders as well. And we have to work with school leaders to build their skills, knowledge and motivation and uplifting the teacher profession. So I think as youth, um, obviously we do want our education, um, the edu uh, our education to improve. Um, and thank you um, for your input, um, Cheryl. Um, I, 
if you do have questions uh, with regards to the presentation, you can drop down um, your questions in the chat box. Um, let's move on to our next um, speaker, who will, uh, which is Anis Barin from Dear Her, who will be speaking about issues that I personally feel should be advocated uh, for every, uh, by everyone, regardless of gender. She's going to present on sexual harassment and violence against women. So I'll pass the floor to you, Anis. Thank you so much, Mahira. Hi, everyone. My name is Anis Baharim from Dear Her. Dear Her is a youth-led women empowerment organization, and we focus on the issues of sexual harassment and sexual violence. So a big question for us is when it comes to gender equality, because my topic for today was actually gender equality, is what does it mean for us to actually achieve gender equality? For a lot of people in Malaysia, they would say, oh, there's like more women in university now and women are quite financially stable. They have it all, they seem to have it all. So what more do women and girls want? And I think a lot of people miss out the fact that when it comes to gender equality, it's not just about financial, it's not just about education, and other things is also about safety, whether we can actually live in Malaysia feeling safe as a woman and girl. So the big question is, is Malaysia safe for women and girls? And I'm not sure if this is a surprising answer for some people, but the short answer is no. Just a quick search itself on the internet has led me to quite a few um, search results or basically survey results regarding the safety of women in Malaysia. And it's quite horrifying. I don't mean to scare any women or girls, but we do have to face reality because even if we have a uh, great education and we have financial and everything, but if let's just say, if half of our population itself continues to live in fear that we can't even go out, uh, walk around without being harassed, we can't even drive at night, we have to continuously think of different rules or how to protect ourselves all the time, then that doesn't mean that our quality of life is the same as our male peers. And I think that has something very important that we have to look into. There's a lot of um, statistics here, but I'm just gonna point out a few. Approximately one in three have experienced sexual harassment and women, approximately one in three women have experienced sexual harassment, only 50% reported or told someone. 62% of working women have experienced sexual harassment in the workplace. And down here, we can see that more than half experience uh, verbal sexual harassment on a regular basis when walking on the streets. 57% have experienced unwanted touching. Approximately one in four have experienced being followed to their cars and homes at least once. 71% have experienced, have received unwanted messages of sexual nature online. 44% have experienced their teacher making sexually provocative jokes, which further highlights the Ayn Husniza case. And even though that is a lot of statistics to digest, I just wanted to show the picture of what a daily life for a Malaysian woman or girl is like. And if we look into all of this, it really boils down to three kind of issues that, that um, are existent in Malaysia. Firstly, we have a persistent rape culture. Uh, we have rampant violence against women. And we also have somewhat normalized pedophilia as, compared, as seen by how the fact that we still refuse to ban child marriage and that there is actually a lot of uh, pedophilic material or content shared on Malaysian servers. And this, like the persistent rape culture and rampant violence against women itself, can be shown as well by the fact that the WHO survey said that over half of Malaysians blame women for sexual assault and say that domestic violence is normal when stressed. <laughs> Again, this might seem scary, but we what we want to do is to continue to improve it. And for us to use, this is actually quite an important issue. Before going into what our demands are, let's look at the current laws and protections because obviously what we were trying to do is asking for the government to create Malaysia to be a safer place. Let's see what's already happening. So firstly, in terms of legislations, the best legislation actually only mainly exists for workplace harassment. So we have the Employment Act, we have the Industrial Relations Act, we have the uh, Communications and Multimedia Act. For children, we have the Child Act, Sexual Offenses Against Children Act. And in terms of penal code for criminal, uh, we, uh, we cover a few types of sexual offenses. 
However, despite having all these legislations, the legislations are not comprehensive. And some of them sometimes are ambiguous, meaning that they use terms like, uh, in the penal code, they use the terms like outrageous on decency, which is quite broad actually, and can cover a lot of things. And even under the penal code, uh, in order to prove um, in court, the outrage on decency is actually very hard and requires a lot of evidence, which usually survivors don't have. And secondly, we also have the tort of sexual harassment. This is when you make a civil claim, you sue someone in court for sexual harassment. However, this with any legal case requires a lot of money, a lot of time, and it's also a, usually a long and very stressful process because you have to go to court and you have to testify, and that's not a good thing for survivors. Thirdly is we usually have institutional and company policies and guidelines. However, this usually applies in companies and even during a survey, it was found that only a minority of companies have a form of sexual misconduct policy, which is worrying. And um, especially when it comes to higher educational institutions, it's even worse. It's actually really few universities in Malaysia have a comprehensive sexual misconduct policy, which creates an unsafe environment for learning. So what are our demands? So when it comes to legislations and policies and why we're highlighting more towards law is because this is our demands towards the government as the youth, we think that more can be done from the government to protect women and girls, especially considering they have the responsibility and the power. So when it comes to legislations and policies, I think this has been repeated quite a lot of times by different um, NGOs and continuously demanded is for them to pass the sexual harassment bill. The bill has been tabled, but even the tabling of the bill itself has continuously been delayed. And even until now, it hasn't been passed, which is very worrying considering the whole like starting of the sexual harassment bill was so many years ago. It is really required for us to have a sexual harassment bill, considering, like I said, mostly um, when it comes to sexual harassment, it is easier if the action occurred in the workplace, but outside the workplace, there are not as many legislations or protections in place. We also demand for a man of relevant legislations, not just the introduction of the sexual harassment bill, but also um, amendment, let's just say, to the penal code to specifically cover sexual offenses. Like I said, a lot of times, even if we have provisions, they are unclear and do not cover everything. So things like stalking and a lot of times online offenses and voyeurism are not really that covered and it's really hard for you to even prove it. Thirdly, we want to ensure that every institution, organization or company actually has a comprehensive and also survivor-centric sexual misconduct policy. We also want the system to change. So when it, you go and report like as a survivor, it's actually a really traumatic process. And sometimes you even can think about like, you know, the negative consequences to you, which actually can, uh, which actually hinders survivors from reporting. So what we need is not only having the legislations and policies, but actually for there to be proper enforcement and implementation of those legislations. And that requires a change of system. So you have to ensure that the system encourages and supports reporting. So when it comes to police officers, medical officers, they have to be trained to actually face um, victim survivors. They can't like, you know, be uh, a, rape, a victim blaming as well. So third, secondly, they have to ensure the safety of survivors. You have to have safe homes, uh, monitor safety. And thirdly, you have to provide support to survivors. Uh, when it comes to mental health, it's not usually provided. You need more legal, um, you need more legal protection as well. And you have to inform their procedures and their rights. But what can we do as a society as well, right? As a society, we also have to continue to raise awareness to combat the rape culture because it is really considered quite bad in Malaysia. And secondly, I think this is usually highlighted, but never really properly implemented by the government is sex, a proper uh, comprehensive sex education in schools because we need our children to understand this concept and for them to be able to recognize it, only then can they know, let's just say, I've been sexually harassed, or I've been sexually assaulted. What do I need to do next? So what is Dear Her, um, my organization doing? We have a project called Chakna Siswa. It's our biggest project. We focus on universities because when I started Dear Her, we were mainly all university students. So 
um, like I repeated just now, only minority of higher educational institutions have a sexual misconduct policy, which is very worrying because it results in a lack of reporting, inaction by the institution. Sometimes, you know, the professors or the lecturers are just set free, nothing actually happens to them, and an unsafe environment for students. A survey conducted by AWAM actually showed that 46.8% of respondents have experienced sexual harassment, which is, like I said, very worrying. And even like um, earlier I mentioned, the Ayn Hus Miza case in schools, like teachers can freely make rape jokes, which means there has to be some kind of change on the of the educational institution to ensure that the students are actually safe and that they are taught that this is wrong. So for China Siswa, what our aim is, is to ensure that every single um, higher educational institution has a comprehensive and survivor-centric sexual misconduct policy. We do it in two phases. Firstly, we have a policy where we are currently drafting the policy. So when we already kind of prepare the sexual misconduct policy and the institutions have an option to adopt it. And secondly, instead of, I mean, other than just having the policy itself, we know how important it is to actually inform people about the policy. So we will have a campaign to ensure that students are informed about the policy, how to report, what are the procedures like, and what are their rights under it. So currently we are in the process of drafting the policy. So that's for all from us from Dear Her. We hope that you, if you are a university student, especially if you're a university student or high school student, you can join us, uh, especially because we will continuously do Chakna Siswa and we need more um, help. Um, and thank you very much. You can also join us and you can follow us on the following um, email, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Anis, for that presentation. Um, um, Dear Her is one of the first few NGOs and campaign that I volunteered in. So Anis and I go way back. So I really applaud the effort on Chakna Siswa to ensure safety in higher education and institution. But I do have some questions for um, Anis to follow up because you did mention that, you know, um, sometimes um, like, so obviously, we have rape culture, violence against women, as well as pedophilia, you mentioned as the main problem. And you did say that, you know, we have law. However, those laws are sometimes insufficient. The legislation are insufficient. Um, sometimes we see harassment happen. Um, these things do happen, but it doesn't impact us. And for some people, uh, we tend to dismiss it. How can we, my question is, how can we be good allies um, and how can we be an individual who can advocate for, um, you know, people who can't speak up for themselves? I think the catchphrase here is just two words, actually, believe survivors. A lot of the time people dismiss them. And the main point is if you want survivors to report and if you want accountability to people, you need survivors to be actually brave enough and feel safe and comfortable to report. And if let's just say the first step is for them to report and like suddenly everyone doesn't believe them um, and there's no one to support them and be by their side because it is a very big thing for them to do it. It can also be a traumatic experience, just the reporting thing itself. You need to ensure that you are there to support them. And even if you just like, you know, tweet out belief survivors or you just tell them, I believe you, it actually brings a lot of comfort for them and gives them the strength for them to actually want to report. I see, I see. Thank you. Thank you so much for that input. Um, um, it's definitely one that we need to take note of, um, but um, you've so you've advocated for Chakna Siswa, which is basically to ensure safety in higher education. But you've also mentioned like harassment in workplace um, and how there's not enough protection in those spaces. But what can we do as an individual or maybe as a company to ensure that safe space exists and to ensure safety towards women? I think as individuals, you if you're working in a company right now, I always tell people you should ask your company if you have a sexual misconduct policy because mm -hmm. a lot of times people don't even know 
Is yeah. there one? Is this right? And if you if there isn't, you should put pressure on your admin or on your HR to actually create one. As a company, um, I think other than just having a policy, you can always I mean, uh, consult with um, NGOs and other, I guess, consulting companies, how to make your uh, company safer. But also it could just be as simple as if you're a superior or if you're a senior, you could just talk to your colleagues and just tell them that, like, are you okay? Like, has anyone harassed you? And just be there for them. Because sometimes it's hard, especially for mm. junior places to actually want to speak up, especially if let's just say the harasser is someone with power or is this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you. An- Thank you so much, Anis, for that input. Um, it's something that we definitely, as a community, need to take note of. And we need, we need to, yeah, we need, we need to work towards. Um, So in the interest of time, I'd like to invite our next speaker, um, Nasru, who will be speaking about challenges faced by persons with disabilities in Malaysia. And it's an issue that's extremely important um, and that community usually gloss over. So I'm really, really interested to hear from him. Um, I'll pass the floor to you, Nasru. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayra. Uh, because you passed the floor to me. Okay. Uh, before I start to present, okay. Um, there are some image description that I'll be putting in the chat soon. Okay. First, uh, let me present here. Yeah. Okay. Here. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Okay, awesome. Okay, first thing first, for our blind friends, like I said earlier, uh, there will be some image description. Uh, before I put it in the chat, I will read it first. This artwork is by a disabled artist, uh, Farid. It shows three people huddled in a ripple umbrella in heavy rain. One is a lady wearing hijab. She's blind and holds a white cane. The person holding the umbrella does not show a visible disability. There's a child seated in a wheelchair. It is in gray scale except for the blue essence of the umbrella, the wheelchair bag and armrest as well as the grip of the white cane. The blue ribbed umbrella has OKU Act 2008 in white on it. This art means to signify the lack of protection of the PWD Act 2008 for our PWDs in Malaysia. At the pointy edge of the umbrella, starting from the upper left counterclockwise, there are blue circles with a sequence of numbers from 1 to 4 in white fonts on them. Okay, um, I'll be put this in the chat. Here we are. Okay. The first thing first, I'm sure that you see this um blue this blue box here uh with a tick on this airbook and corrupt upaya and with a cross or a cross mark on the differently able and client upaya. Okay, on this matter, I will discuss further after this if I have time. Okay, the thing that I want to show to you today is about the challenges faced by the persons with disabilities in Malaysia. Okay, we'll go to the first topic, which is uh, the in terms of education. Okay, there are uh, please bear in mind there are two main topics about uh, education, about employment, about healthcare that I will be talking today, but I will be focusing on the stigma and discrimination faced by the PWD. Okay, in terms of the stigma of education, what what does the PWD face? Okay, 
do you know that PWDs cannot be enrolled in the mainstream education as soon as they has an OKU card? This is the current practice as for now. Even there are some zeros reject policy. The policy is there, but unfortunately, the implementation is not there. And PWDs must be institutionalized. This is the stigma. This is what people think. Okay, uh, okay, you have to be institutionalized. Okay, you can masuk to a certain pusat jagaan or rehabilitation. And sometimes parents decline to send their children to school because they think that they can take care of their children. Okay, next in the education is discrimination. So in terms of discrimination, especially in terms of education, like uh, I think Cheryl mentioned before, there are some of uh, loopholes regarding with uh, education so in terms of pwd we are not ex we are not excluded from the problem which is some of them is rejection from the mainstream school and sometimes the school lack of accessibility based on the lived experience of some of my disabled friends they said that they sometimes have to they are struggling to for example um climbing stairs okay speaking from my own experience actually during my Secondary school, it was quite hard for me. It took time for me to climb the stairs. So I was like, it, it's such kind of pressure because at that time I was climbing the stairs while everyone sometimes, I can say, not really mocking, lah, but they are, <laughs> they are doing something making me feel unease. Okay. So basically, that is one of the thing. Another thing is bullied by the teachers and the students. Based on my research in my undergraduate thesis, okay, um, you know what? One teacher called her student or his student as crazy because he has an autism. Okay, this happens before. Uh, this is a lived experience from one of my interviewee. And during his um during his uh secondary school he also has been bullied by the students the students said that uh the students mock him actually because he has a Tourette syndrome okay if you want to know about Tourette syndrome maybe if i have time i'll explain later but basically uh, you can uh google after this okay so next thing is healthcare in terms of healthcare Maybe we think, okay, there are no, not much stigma lah about this healthcare and whatnot. Actually, there is. Okay, the first stigma is actually sometimes the medical practitioner thought that PWDs cannot make their own decision. So, I have to, to ask uh, their caregiver one of the story that I got from my friends. Um, he said that basically the doctors, even uh, it's the medical decision is quite private. The doctors refers uh, to the caregiver instead directly to him. And also, PWD are perceived as medically imperfect. As we know, or maybe uh, for your information, basically, um, in terms of basic concept of disability, there are several, which is the medical concept, there are social concept, social concept, uh, tragedy and charity concept and also the uh, human rights model or human rights concept of disability. So basically based on the medical model, medical model views disability just as an impairment. Uh, there are difference actually between impairment and disability. Impairment is a long-term condition while disability is the interaction, is the, uh, is the hindered function because of the interaction that happens between humans there are social barriers or you can say the barriers that hinders the interaction ah that is the uh, more accurate explanation about it maybe you can look into the united nations conventions of rights of persons with disabilities and also the pwd act 2008 uh, to look at the definitions there are two terms which is impairment and also disability. Okay, next is in terms of the stigma of the uh, related to healthcare, doctor tends to correct physical imperfections 
and next is lack of accessible facilities and services i'm speaking based on my own experience my mother was warded and when i am looking for uh, an accessible toilet it was located quite far from the main building it was located near the um, i think in malay we call complex rawatan harian or com complex rawatan pakar something like that as near a specialist center in that hospital so it was quite far you can you can imagine how long i have to bear with the urge to go to, to go to the toilet just to do, to go to the toilet okay next is exclusion from the insurance policy during i i'm opening an, a bank account uh, there is an insurance agent uh, just they just give a quick check for me and he he said to me that oh because i am a pwd i am in, excluded from the insurance policy okay next is the sorry it's related to the healthcare okay next is related to the healthcare uh, sorry <laughs> not healthcare employment there are some uh, some technical errors on my side sorry please bear with me okay um so basically the first thing is the stigma okay pwds are perceived as less productive and pwds only suitable for support roles in employment not as executive roles in terms of this actually it's my own experience um i go to this one career fair and they segregated they segregated different types of disabilities with different types of work i was my thought was at a particular time okay this is uh quite a discrimination because you are putting a stigma that okay pwds are only can work like this 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 and this and this type of PWD can work only this this and this my question is why not you interview them first and let let them show to you what they can do instead of judging okay this person can do this this person can do that that is not very proper that is very exclusive not inclusive okay in terms of the discrimination this is based on my own research uh, with my team basically <clears throat> um, in terms of employment challenges during COVID-19 you know what one of my interviewee reported that she was forced to resign because she always uh, <clears throat> sorry because she always go to the hospital and another thing is because she's perceived oh you are not that productive you cannot work like this to work at the customer service you have to work like this <laughs> that is what she told us and second is gaslighting this is what i myself encountered when i was work i was working before i was gaslighted by my own boss he made me feel like oh this mistake is mine and i have to own it and i have to bear with it forever and he makes me think that i am not capable to work at that particular place like okay maybe you can work at others but not at this place uh he makes me think like that uh, so gaslighting is part of bullying because if you go to the definition of bullying it is considered as a negative repeated negative actions so bullying at workplace means repeated negative actions at workplace okay sometimes pwd have to be overworked why because of the unequal work distribution to them why i say it is unequal maybe or i can say unequitable uh, this is more accurate term unequitable work distribution to them sometimes not all pwd you have to understand their limit you have to ask them what is your limit how many work that i can give to you that you can complete that you sure that you can complete okay you have to give them based on their capacity not based on your own logical thinking no uh, so the thing that you have to know is you have to ask the persons with disability themselves because only them only they know what are they capable of okay next is in terms of the exclusion from the employment act do you know do you know that uh pwd are excluded from the employment act in terms of the discrimination yeah it is excluded and for the pwds with mental disorder or i can say 
with psychosocial or mental disabilities, it increases their chance to be to be laid off because of why? Because of the fear that uh, their medical condition may relapse, and because it feel they, because the employer fears that okay, uh, this person maybe always take leave lah after this. Maybe uh, he won't be that productive. He cannot work here lah, for example. Okay, that is what happens. And next, notice it's almost uh, the end of the presentation. Okay, basically, there are two proposed solutions. Okay, it's not fair for me to not to say the problems without the solution, right? Uh, so, this is the solution. Okay. Uh, this is the solution which is the twin track approach. There are two parts, two main parts of the twin track approach. This is a big one. This is a macro level, not a micro level. Okay. Uh, in terms of the mainstream approach, it needs to ensure that the persons with disabilities have equal access to their fundamental needs, to their basic needs in all interventions and on an equal basis with other members of their community. Other members of their community means the society, not only uh, within the disabled community as well. They need to have an equal basis, equal access with others. If the non-disabled get this, the disabled also need to get need to get the same thing. Uh, so I mean in terms of the needs, not the work, because the work is it depends on the intervention. Uh, this I will explain in the targeted approach. Okay, in terms of the example for mainstream approach is the amendment and enforcement. There are no use if you amend but you didn't you didn't enforce the PWDs Act 2008. Why? Because PWDs Act 2008 is only an administrative act. It has no power. It is toothless. There are no use. Uh, I can say. So, um, in terms of the Mental Health Act 2001. It was given power by the PWD Act. If the PWD Act has no power, has no tooth, how can it act on itself? And also, Penal Code 309 about the, de about the criminalization of suicide. Okay, we should decriminalize suicide. And about the moratorium of Penal Code 309, I haven't heard about it after it, it is being said that uh, AGC has approved about it. I don't. I don't heard any any news after that. Ah, uh, and also the UBBL Universal Bidding by Laws, and also the Employment Act 1955. It should include the persons with disabilities. Okay, for the mainstreaming approach, it's done. Next is the target. It's the targeted approach for the target. For the targeted approach, persons with disabilities have specific needs that must be addressed in order to empower them and enhance their quality of life. How? How, you may ask? By making sure that you ask the persons with disabilities, what is your specific needs? What do you need? You need to do an intervention. You need to ask them. You need to have a set of questions. Okay, uh, can you work with this? Can you work with that? What, is you need? what, is, what do you need? Because, based on my own research, it is stated that, for example, people who are using wheelchair, or you can say a physically disabled people using a wheelchair, physically disabled person using a wheelchair. Okay, the first thing that he thought about going to work is to find toilet. Maybe it's easy for us who are not using wheelchair or who don't have a mobility problem to move around and find toilets was not a problem for us. Uh, but it's a problem for them. It may look simple, but it's their basic needs. Okay, so you have to address them in order to empower them and enhance their quality of life. Okay, with due that, I rest my case. Thank you. Okay, if you have any questions, you can ask me. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Nasrul, um, from Bole Space. Um, uh, obviously, I think there are a lot you've mentioned how there are a lot of challenges faced by persons with disabilities. Um, you've also mentioned how workspaces are also sometimes, they, do, they don't adhere to these standards. And how do we ensure, I guess, as an individual to like push for companies, also like lawmakers, in order for them to enforce these things? What are the steps that as individual we can take, as allies, because we also want to help, you know, 
uplift um, persons with disabilities. Okay, yeah, okay. How for you guys to help the persons mm. with disabilities is the first thing, the first, first, most basic thing is ask. What mm. do you need? Okay, that's the first thing that I can say. Because it happens to myself, my friend who is using a wheelchair. My, I'm sorry to say that my house is not really that accessible. See. Because it, it's, fine, it's fine for me. But for my friend, he struggled a bit. But instead of I say, oh, you need to use this, you need to use that. Mm. I ask him, what do you need? How for you to do this? Because it's his own autonomy. It's his own, uh, the body is his own. So let him decide. That is my answer for that. All right. Thank you, Nasrul. I guess as individual, we must have the initiative to ask um, persons with disabilities what they want. And it's something that we need to take note of um, to help our, yeah, to help our, to help our friends. Um, so last but not least, a presentation. Thank you, Nasrul, for that brilliant, brilliant presentation. I learned a lot from it. Um, before we move on to Q&As, I'd like to then invite our, uh, our climate justice warrior, Heng. Um, from Greenpeace. Um, he'll be presenting on climate justice and global plastic pollution. Okay, uh, thank you, Mahira, for the introductions. Uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Why not? Okay, uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, yeah. right. thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, again, uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, again, uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, you can call me Hanks. I'm a Greenpeace uh, Malaysia campaigner. And today I would like to share with you about a story in Malaysia uh, because the topic given is climate justice. But I also would like to connect the climate justice to a global plastic pollution. Um, like one of the examples is this, uh, a case study in Malaysia. If you have remember, like a few, uh, few years ago, Malaysia was known as like uh, Tong Sampa Dunia, like the dumping ground from all uh, the world dumping ground. Uh, so this is uh, what we can see right now. Okay, this is the, the photo that we got uh, from in a place in Jenjaro in Kuala Langat, uh, Selangor. And after that, in 2000s, this happened because of uh, the China, the China uh, impact. Uh, China used to uh, import all these plastic waste for recycling purpose from all around the world. When China closed its door, when China announced its uh, national sword policy in 2018, which means that they will not uh, no longer receive the plastic waste from other uh, developed countries. So that's why uh, Southeast Asian countries, especially Malaysia, uh, became the next destination to import all these plastic waste for recycling purpose. And up, uh, plastic recycling uh, is good. The concern now is uh, after we went down to the, uh, the ground, we received a complaint from lots of committee members. We found that this is a global broken system. That's why we published a two report in 2018, known as Recycling Need, to highlight the global uh, broken system. And then in 2020, to highlight the toxic after effect of all this uh, plastic uh, problem. Okay, so in 2012, uh, 2018, uh, uh, this is the updates uh, from the field. We found a lot of plastic waste from many developed countries, all these high income countries that who always claim that they do a lot of good work in recycling, but actually not. So on the ground, we found a lot of all these plastic was, in, was shifted from developed country into Malaysia. And we received lots of uh, complaints from local community about the increased risk of water pollution and air pollution. And I, I believe that in the past few years, you, will, you might heard of, of all this issue, like people's, the local committee received the threat from all this uh, mafia, from all this uh, waste, uh, I mean, the uh, illegal uh, industry who, who abuse their license to do all this, uh, to process all this uh, plastic waste. So at the same time, there are lots of documentary or, or like international media came to Malaysia to document the problem. For example, like BBC, uh, they came here to collect their plastic waste from UK, and then they went back to pressure their own government not to throw the plastic to Malaysia. 
There are also some uh, media from Canada, there are media from Turkey, from Germany that did the same thing. That is also the reasons why this uh, issue became a, a huge, uh, uh, generate, generated lots of uh, debate all around the world. Yeah, this is some of the example that we found. Like in a place in Sungai Patani, in, uh, we found lots of plastic waste that were just dumped and they were just burn it, uh, just, they were just dump it in the abandoned building. In a rural area, they would just burn it. And this one, this is a plastic we found. Uh, we found it uh, from UK, from Germany, and also from Netherlands. And this is a, uh, the, the plastic waste that we found in uh, Kuala Langat. And then, yeah, you can see like the bomba, uh, the firemen are doing the firefighting. These are all these examples. And after that, uh, to collect all, we have also organized a groups of team to collect the sampling. And we went to a few places in uh, Sungai Patani, in Kerda, we went to Selangor, and we also went to a few places to collect the, uh, the water and also soil sampling. So um, I think uh, the, some of the finding, uh, I think the, is, uh, is this, is we, in the sampling, we found that there are lots of the heavy metals like cabrium and lead are um, the metals of concerns. Like lead is known to cause the intellectual uh, disability with no known safe level in the blood. And then exposure to lead could result in decreased uh, intelligence in children and may uh, lead to behavioral difficult and learning problem. So which means overall the finding from all these investigations have revealed that the, all this shredded plastic disposed and all these several, uh, several dump sites in Malaysia contains a range of uh, metal, uh, including the uh, persistent organic uh, pollutants, which has uh, likely been contaminating the surrounding environments during their processing activity. And then uh, if, uh, we have published this report, the technical report, uh, after collecting the sampling. For more detail, you can go to our website to, get, uh, to read the report. So after we launched the reports, we use these uh, in reports to lobby uh, the Malaysian government to highlight that this is not just a one or two countries problem. It's a global problem we need to, tack to tackle it uh, together. And then the government also uh, took some uh, positive steps. I think in 2020, Malaysian government managed to ship back a container with all this contaminated plastic waste back to the country origins. And at the same time, uh, cracked down more than 300 uh, illegal uh, uh, facility that do not have a license to operate their, 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 their uh, recycling activity. So this is a good thing. But this does not, does not uh, stop here. We cannot just rely on government to do it alone because plastic pollution is everyone's problem. Because it, as long as we are humans, we are consumer, we are contributing to this uh, plastic pollution. That is also the reasons we want to uh, like push for more solution. So what is the solution? So we found that a lot of the plastic waste, especially single-use plastic, are contributed by the global fast-moving consumer goods company. So we are lobbying all these companies to, uh, I mean, to uh, provide more solutions. Like for example, these are some uh, the solutions that we would like to provide. Like we want to focus on uh, reusable solutions. The reusable that focus on just uh, durable, convenient, using safer material, and also make it affordable and cheap. And by using this kind of uh, reusable solution, we can reduce the plastic pollution. And uh, beside that, we also have other uh, mechanisms such as reusable or refill system that are already exist. What we need to do, just tap on the existing efforts and to uh, lobby the governments, lobby the corporations to focus more on, uh, to invest the facility, the infrastructure, so that all these mechanisms are growing. Okay, so beside talking, beside uh, 3R, there are actually more than just 3R. Before we talk about recycling, there are a lot of R. Like what you can see here is rethink. Before you buy something, rethink, do you really need the, the, the product? If you do not need it, just don't buy it. Rethink, refuse, reduce, redesign. Redesign is important because redesign the delivery system based on alternative, based on... Um, alternative delivery system, which is more environmental friendly. Reuse it, refill it, repurpose. Before we throw the, the product, throw the rubbish, throw it into uh, to landfill, just repurpose or repair it. And then recycle should be the last solution. So when I, uh, when I, I show this uh, chart, it, show, it shows that we don't, we don't always focus on 3R. There are actually more than, more than 3R. 
In here, you can see like eight R. I want to add more is uh, repair. Repair is another R. So before recycle it, please, there are many R that we can focus on. Another burning questions that we always uh, discuss is, uh, okay, now we are in the COVID pandemic. So how do we stay safe, stay healthy and try to practice, uh, I mean, and try to be more eco-friendly, especially a lot of people, like we always use single-use plastic, like, okay, like this is uh, what we have done. Okay, a recent uh, study has shown that the COVID-19 uh, virus can remain viable on many faces, uh, many uh, surfaces. For example, four hours on coppers, 24 hours on cardboards, 48 hours on stainless steel, and up to 72 hours on plastic. And which means, based on the guidance from World, and, uh, World Health Organizations, cleaning the surface with simple disinfectant is the most effective way to kill the virus. Which means, the bottom line uh, is reusable items are safe to use when we clean it with water, clean it with soaps. And, there's, and if we just wrap, the, wrap it with plastic, it's not 100% safe. So even if we wrap it in plas uh, plastic, we still have to wash it. Wash it with water is, uh, is the uh, final solution. And there's no substitute for all this uh, thorough uh, hygiene. So the conclusions that I want to highlight is, okay, this is uh, for plastic pollution. Recycling is good, but the currently recycling alone cannot fix our global plastic pollution fast enough. Globally, the plastic uh, recycling is only 9% as of 2015. 9% of uh, plastic recycling, 12% being incinerated, and the rest 79% end up in natural environment. That is also the reason we can see like sea creatures, the turtles, the dolphin, the whales die because of all this plastic pollution. Again, plastic recycling is good, but plastic recycling alone cannot fix our global pollution fast enough. This is the problem is overconsumption. So the solutions should, uh, solution to all this overconsumption should be reduction. And last but not least, by doing all this uh, ca campaign, we are calling the governments and company to set clear reductions to enforce as extended producer responsibility. At the same time, set clear reductions target for non-essential plastic and invest in redesigning alternatives such as uh, refills and reuse system. Okay. So the last one, the other ones I would like to connect it to climate justice, like plastic pollution is just one of the climate problems that we are facing right now. So what can we hope? What should we hope? Plastic pollution is a byproduct of all this uh, fossil fuel. And now people are, uh, we, are, we are having the throwaway culture. So now we need to rethink our throwaway culture. Before we buy something, just ask ourselves, do we really need all this product? Do we have alternative? Can we uh, reduce it? Do we, do we have a re redesign mechanism before purchasing a product? So this is, uh, otherwise, uh, it will cause more overconsumption problem. So what we, in the future, the resources are depleting. So we need to be smart how to manage our current natural resources. So the, the, there are two key points I would like to highlight is, we have to liberate ourselves from all this fossil fuel capitalism and overconsumption habit. For example, we can try to draw inspiration from the Green New Deal and push for this low carbon stimulus package or even known as a green economic recovery plan that promote clean energy, that the clean energy that also create a new job opportunity. At the same time, we also need a legislation advocating for keepers before polluter. To hold all this funding to a uh, big polluter, we have to save all this uh, subsidy to fund adequate healthcare, to fund stronger, uh, better disaster me uh, relief mechanism, to fund better food security mechanism so that we can prevent ourselves from the next public health crisis and as well as to address current uh, climate injustice. So you want, uh, like this, uh, this uh, picture, it shows that, yeah, we need to organize ourselves. We know that it's not easy to tackle, to confront, the big polluter who have lots of resources. But if we united, we will, de we will be never be defeated. I would like to uh, end up in a positive uh, note. I've been campaigning for a few years about this uh, plastic pollution, and my current load is moved to tackling the air pollution, which is even worse. And the message that I would like to uh, share with all these uh, businesses that 
uh, I think ten years. I think ten years ago, when we talk about protecting environment, people just say us like, okay, you guys environmentalists, you just want to uh, act against uh, economy. You want to uh, you are againsting the development. We are not against development, but we want to promote sustainable development. Please remember, even if we want to develop an economy, if we want an economic growth, remember there is also another terms known as eco. So, which means we need eco in economy. So the future is in our hand. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Heng, um, for that really extremely thorough presentation. Um, but before I move on to the Q and A's, I just want to ask, like the government, like you've mentioned, and I just want to, I guess, validate with you because you've mentioned that the government took proactive steps to crack down on illegal um, plastic dumping. Uh, and you've also mentioned how reports were sent to the Malaysian government. Was there any significant effort into dealing with plastic uh, pollution aside from that? Uh, there are two issues. The first, uh, the presentation I shared is focused more on the imported plastic waste from many developed countries. Uh, because after submitting the reports to governments, we also want to tell that this uh, imported plastic waste trade is a wake-up call that no country should be used as a dumping ground and all the countries have to deal with their own waste problem. And from this incident, we can see like a lot of high-income countries or rich countries, they're actually uh, exploiting the, uh, the environments. They are actually taking advantage on all these developing countries because the environmental uh, regulation is weaker, the enforcement is uh, weaker than the developed country. So the businesses, the capitalists are exploiting the opportunity. So we want to tell, use this to tell governments that Okay, Malaysia also have our own, I think we have our own uh, waste problem. We mm. have to deal with their own waste problem. And meanwhile, the rich country, all the country have to deal with their own problem. And then from this top-down uh, issue, we have to tell that, that plastic pollution is also contributed by consumer, by ourselves. We can try to reduce our, all these unnecessary single-use plastic. At the same time, pressure co corporations to set clear reductions of all these single-use plastic and set up uh, alternative delivery system, which is more environmental friendly. And yeah, the process is not, not that it's complicated, it's not that fast, but I can see there are some positive steps taken by the policymaker. Over. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Hang, for that uh, presentation. Um, we have so many questions from the floor, actually. And if you just started tuning in, um, thank you. Um, you are currently uh, watching Youth Manifesto, Apobilia Mahu. Um, let's move on to the Q&As. Uh, first, I'd like to ask a question to Jason. And I would also like to complement it um, with my perspective as well, uh, especially coming from Sabah. Um, there are the, uh, diverse cultures and races. Sometimes some communities become tribalistic or exclusionary towards others uh, because even they, are, they felt that their interests are not safeguarded or is on the line. Um, so sometimes they felt that they have to trade that off. And I'd like to supplement it with the question from the audience. It says, in your opinion, what would a meaningfully and healthy diverse Malaysia look like? And how do we get there? Yeah, thanks, Mahira. I, I think that's a great question because I think the campaigns we've been fed have painted this picture of Malaysia that's, you know, healthily diverse as like, you know, uh, there's rainbows, everything's nice, everything's great. Uh, but the reality of it is that democracies and multicultural democracies uh, at that are, can be incredibly messy. And it's bound to be incredibly messy because I think exactly what you said, right? At the point at which, you know, communities feel threatened versus and the when communities start excluding other groups, that line is quite blurred. And I don't think it's the state's responsibility to determine what that line is, although they, it should take a hard line against the, the latter, which is exclusionary attitudes. But right now in Malaysia, we are drawing that line way too far to one side that, you know, that any form of discussion of, of these issues can be considered sensitive or we're not, these conversations are not trickling down into classrooms, they're not trickling down into uh, subaltered spaces. So where do we go from here? Um, and I think what does this healthy Malaysia look like? I think it's a, a, a healthily diverse Malaysia is one full of contest. It's one that we are having discussions. And I think obviously there, there is a risk where 
uh, a lot of contest leads to instability, it leads to uh, tensions arising. But we're not going to get to a healthy place without going through the rough patches first. Um, even in our political sphere, where this course is so tense right now, where we've seen so much political instability, but we need that political instability first to move forward to a better phase and to kind of reconstruct and reconstitute what we've had in the past. I, I know this counts, I know, sounds kind of vague, but really it's about letting go of the reals, I think on the, the state's part and making sure that people are engaging and you know we're not, we're, we're giving them agency to determine their own pathway rather than the other way around. I think that's really when the healthy, uh, diverse uh, communities can be formed. Uh, and, you know, uh, obviously the state needs to guide it because if it goes too far in one way, you know, social media algorithms pushes to uh, echo chambers, it pushes to bubbles, and that's quite uh, pernicious. And it's, it's a problem faced by many uh, advanced democracies as well. So the state needs to really uh, build the bridges, but let people cross the bridges themselves and not be pushed into it. All right, thank you so much uh, for that explanation, Jason. Um, that's super insightful. Um, before I move on, I, I guess I'll just go around with the questions from the floor. Um, so I have a question from Yi Sin Lo towards Cheryl. She said, um, what is the true meaning for, illit for literacy? How proficient do students need to be to consider literate? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think when I was, uh, uh, we have, of course, different levels that we want the student to achieve. But if the student is functionally literate, uh, it's enough. That means they, they know enough, they can speak enough, both in English and BM, in order for them to function. And if not English, then at least just BM alone. And uh, being literate also means that they can read, they can write, and also there is that comprehension. So it's not enough for them just to read and write, but they must also understand what they are reading and writing. So, uh, and if we know literacy in English is one that students struggle the most because while they can read and write, uh, many times they don't comprehend, they cannot understand what uh, they are reading and writing. So th there are different levels to it. But when we say someone is illiterate, like a child is illiterate, that means they don't even have that functional literacy basic is not there in order for them to function. So, yeah, mm, I see. Read, write, um, and comprehend. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, I'll just uh, supplement another question from the same user. Um, is the census you mentioned published by the government annually? Uh, so enrollment rates, uh, SPM scores, uh, even um, the number of teachers, all of this is published annually. So it's all available online and it's all there for people to look at it. Yeah. And right. even the budget as well. All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So for those who are interested, you can definitely check it out. Um, thank you for that um, answer. I'll move on uh, to Anis. There is a question from uh, the floor. For Chakna Siswa, how many universities have you engaged with to adopt the policy and how have they responded so far? Are many keen to adopt the policy? Hashtag name and shame. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't think I can name and shame. But um, it's actually not a lot because we're mostly focusing on the drafting of the policy itself. So we've been doing a lot of research and we have been um, consulting with other people like NGOs, other NGOs and activists about the policy, but not yet uh, universities. But we have reached out to several student unions because we kind of feel like it's a better strategy if we get the students on board first and mm -hmm. kind of um, also understand uh, the fact that each university is different. So we do need input from the students itself in order to create a, a policy which is comprehensive. So it's not like every, a po the policy is just cut and paste. We do hope that the policy can be structured or specific to the institution itself. So uh, we've spoken to a few student unions and obviously um, it's the yeah, students themselves and have some, and some of them have faced that reality themselves. They are positive towards it. And hopefully we'll be able to speak to more student unions. And once, I think only once the policy itself is completed and we have more uh, student unions on board, only then we will, would we start speaking to universities because we understand that um, sometimes it's, it's kind of hard for us to pass the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Anis. Um, I do applaud that work and hopefully we can see it materialize in the future. Um, I'll move on to the next um, speaker. Uh, 
question from he for Heng from John Lee. Um, he asks, there are statistical evidence suggesting that fishnets are the most significant factor of sea pollution. To what extent is this valid? I'm curious as well. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks for asking. Yeah, I agree uh, on this. Uh, because a few years back, Greenpeace published a report to highlight that uh, fishing net is also one of the contributing factor to this uh, plastic pollution. And we, we actually, we have this data to show that this is significant. And we published many times and then not many media or policymakers talking about this because maybe the talk, the audience is focused more on the fishing, uh, fishing pops, I mean, the, the fishermen's uh, community. And unfortunately, the, po the policymaker didn't focus it. But I would like to say like, yes, correct. Fishing net uh, pollution is also one of the, the uh, uh, contributing factors. So we also have to tackle it uh, from the source. And, but at the same time, I would also want to say that uh, besides fishing nets problem, there are also lots of the global fast-moving consumer goods company. They are trying to continue to push their agenda to produce, overproduce all these single-use plastic. I mean, I mean, uh, in, uh, like from time to time, and they are increasing the productions. So, which means besides tackling the fishing nets problem, we also have to tackle the overconsumption uh, problems. Uh, caused by all these global fast-moving consumer goods company. We cannot just focus on one sector. We need, we need uh, different efforts. Besides tackling fish, uh, fishing net uh, problem, global fast-moving consumer goods company, the uh, governments, I mean, in United Nations, we also have to tack, go back to our consumer. Plastic pollution is contributed by everyone. So we need regional efforts. We need global efforts to tackle it together. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Hang, for that. Uh, input, something that we can learn uh, from definitely. Um, now I'd like to move on to natural. Um, question, the first question, the government created a 1% policy for persons with disabilities to be employed. How is this coming along? Can you explain to us about this and share some insights? Okay, thank you, Mahira. Okay, basically in terms of the 1% policy, based on the research that I've done, basically there are only, there are not all of the government government agencies achieve the one percent. If I'm not mistaken, there are only four, but I cannot remember to name all of the four. But um, based on the, if I'm not mistaken, the document was the RMK twelve, um, the RMK twelve plan. It had it had already stated that the percentage for the one percent is actually right now is zero point three three percent, which means it's only one third of the population that has been um on kata apa tu has been absorbed in the government agencies as for now wow 0.33 is very low um yeah but it's like it's i guess like it's a good knowledge for us to know um and especially like i think it's something that we definitely need to advocate for um, we need to pressure and push companies to, I guess, implement this policy and make it happen and see it materialize. Thank you so much, Nasrul, for that um, data. Um, now I'd like to move on back to Jason. Um, there's a question from the floor from Roderick. Um, it's hot. Um, so he, 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 he asks, is Bumi incentive considered as exclusionary narrative? Uh -huh. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks, Roderick, for the question. I, I think put it in the chat just now as well, but just to, to recapture, um, the Bumi Putra, you know, privileges slash the NEP debate is a contentious one, right? Um, on one hand, a lot you need to understand that when in the in, when the NEP was formulated and during the 1970s, there was vast inequality and inequalities that perhaps is difficult to comprehend um, today. And I think those affirmative action motives were very much baked in at the time and are still very much important, right? Uh, on the other hand, the NEP or, you know, Bumi Putra privileges that we see today have also been colored by um, kind of exclusionary narratives that because that an, uh, an individual or a group deserves it regardless of economic inequality, uh, simply because of uh, primal status in, in the nation. Now, I think, while this should be two separate kind of motives, they obviously have blended in with one another. 
And that's really, really where the problem lies, I think, in this. Um, and so is it exclusionary? Like, it could be, uh, but obviously there are very fair grounds to why uh, NEP or affirmative actions were taken in place to begin with. Now, I think the, the step moving forward, and I think this affects, you know, education primarily as well, so I definitely want to let Cheryl chime in if she wants to, but where, uh, where can affirmative action end in certain cases when the targets are achieved? And this is colored, uh, you know, education because there are institutions such as MRSMs, there are institutions such as SVPs and UATMs that receive, you know, a lot of funding as well from that. Um, and so that, therefore there is con contest to like how much uh, funds are distributed and all these things are not as transparent as it could be. So it's really difficult to evaluate the successes and to the extent of NEP in the past few years. Now, I'm not an expert in this. I would highly recommend Dr. Liu Han as a reference point. But I think when we're talking about diversity um, and how do we ensure that these spaces are inclusive, uh, we also need to recognize that many of these institutions that are related to policies like this do create uh, monocultural, monoracial spaces that are you know, not as great, uh, both on you know, Bumiputra and non Bumiputra ends. So people react to these policies in different ways, which could encourage uh, self-segregation, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Jason. Um, I guess like just to, because um, the question is, I guess a bit similar on the, uh, um, on exclusionary narrative. Um, question from Nikhil, would the Hudud Law Initiative that passed kept pushing be considered as exclusionary narrative as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you can label a lot of things as exclusionary narratives, right? Uh, but I think the danger is that, you know, if you label everything exclusionary, then, you know, you're like, oh, you're, you're exclusionary and then you never bring people to the table to actually have that conversation. So I think pushing for a particular policy isn't necessarily exclusionary, right? Uh, like the, if the Hudut law, I think that there's fair, you know, arguments there. But I think the question of, you know, what are the sentiments surrounding a particular policy push could be exclusionary. But that is not to say that we need to shut down discussion of Hudut law altogether, because these are communities that come with valid grievances, that come with, uh, you know, arguments from their own uh, own silos, their own, own groups. And those are very fair. All of us are in our own separate silos, right? So I think the way kind of to, to navigate these kinds of, you know, perhaps threatening policies for particular people is to embrace them in the table and ensure that conversation happens. Because right now we're not even there yet um, to have that table, round table discussion because any form of discussion is either you know, really scary to have or you're gonna be attacked on, online. Um, and that's not the way to move places forward. Um, so first structural issues of making sure that sedition laws are repealed but, and then you have that uh, encourage that form of and facilitate these conversations institutionally and socially. Right. Thank you so much, Jason, for the very insightful um, per perspective, as well as we can learn a lot from Jason. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to pass the floor then to Cheryl. You can add on to what Jason has mentioned also, but I have a question from the floor from John Lee. Um, he, meant, he asked, in a world where micro colleges exist, where you have access to one of the highest quality education resources, what do you think the future of education looks like? Yeah, um, I think as uh, in what I do and when we train teachers, we often ask them this as well, right? If students had access to all this knowledge and, you know, they continue having access to the best knowledge, right? Then what is the role of the teachers and what, how can teachers continue to play an important role and what will education look like for the students? And for us, um, I, I don't think teachers will be, will, will, will be replaced by technology, but I think the role of the teachers will now change to become facilitators. So how I envision uh, education, and I think of uh, my daughter, my daughter goes to an experimental design thinking school, and in her school, they, she learns about like all these elements that we are talking about today at a very young age. So they learn about consent. I think Anis, you know, we, we you spoke a lot about um, uh, consent and and um, rape uh, jokes happening, right? So they learn about consent, and, and she's four. 
So they learn about consent, they learn about respecting people with disabilities, they learn about recognizing privileges, diversity, and all of these things. And, and when I look at, at what she's doing in school, and I'm like, wow, this is the future. This is what our kids are going to look like so that we are not having this same discussion 10 years later, right? Mm-hmm. And, and like what Jason said just now as well, we need to start um, talking about these things. But right now, it's so scary to even talk or even if one person suggests, oh, um, I think we should do away with vernacular schools. And then it becomes a, a big, you know, very heated, very angry discussion. And um, I was just thinking about how when uh, the, the three pages of Jawi was, was introduced or that it's always been there and then suddenly it was brought to light and how people reacted to it without actually just talking first like why why was yeah we introduced why is this important and people straight went to like protesting in front of the ministry of education but i hope like when we think about the future of education students are um, because at an early age we start inducting them to issues to, to how do you hold respectful discussions how do you uh, think about these things how do you understand your privilege and and what can you contribute and then I think you know in a few years time or in like 10 years time and 15 years time when it's my my kids turn to, to be here they will be having and all these discussions and then hopefully things change by then but I see that as the, the future of education Right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Hopefully that will also happen, like even in current generation and also materialize in the future. We really hope that for the future of our generation. Thank you so much for that insight. Um, now I'd like to move on to Anis. Um, so there's a question from the floor. What do you think sex education can look like in Malaysia? What should we thought? Um, first, I have to admit that I'm no expert in this. Um, whatever knowledge I have is quite limited to my reading. And I would actually recommend um, Aisha from Hello Spot Girl. Hello Spot Girl has been doing a lot in regards to uh, sexual education. But in my opinion, how, how it should look like is right now in our education system, what I've seen is it's kind of indirect. So you would learn it from biology and so forth. And there have been certain... Um, efforts by the ministry to kind of introduce sexual education, but I'm not entirely sure if all schools have it already and like how, um, how many times it is conducted. But uh, I guess what I would envision is something more similar to the Western countries where they do have a direct um, edu- sexual education, specific classes just for it with a, a proper curriculum and for them to teach issues such as uh, knowing how, what a sexual uh, act is in the first place, because how are you going to recognize that you're being sexually assaulted or sexually harassed if you don't even know what a sexual act looks like? And there's actually quite a lot of people who don't know. And when we explain to them, this is what a sexual act is, then suddenly do they realize that they they have been sexually harassed. So that's very important to be taught even at a young age, like Cheryl pointed out. And also consent as well, like what Cheryl pointed out, it's very important to be taught. So a lot of people think sexual education is not necessarily it's a taboo um, topic, especially in our conservative country. But it is something that has to be taught from a young age because it happens because a lot of young girls and boys don't know about these things that they have to know. So sexual acts itself, uh, consent, how to use protection and so forth. Um, birth control, all those are important because it affects um, everyone. Even in, if you talk about birth control and you talk about knowing about protection, that does affect gender equality as well, right? Because if more women or more young girls are being like pregnant from a young age, then they cannot access education. They would have to mm. possibly be forced into marriage. And there's so many effects negative consequences when you don't have sexual proper sexual education in um in the schools i see i see thank you anis um evidently um sexual education is very important um in malaysia and hopefully it's something that you know all schools can implement and um i guess like people in schools like we we can be exposed to it and we can learn from it um thank you anis for that insight um now i'd like to move on to nasrul um, there are questions from the floor and they ask, why do we use persons with disability and not differently abled or special or any other term? Okay, uh, I can say it's a simple answer, which is, I can say the first thing is we are not special. We are just being disabled. We are not different. Uh, 
so that's why we are not using differently able because people always use it's either disability and normal or this uh, people with disability or persons with disabilities with normal and also disabled and normal and also disabled and able that is the term which is i can say is quite in itself is quite offensive uh, because we are disabled and non-disabled uh, because disability is self by concept it is a condition that is being hindered by the society is not a physical or physiological or even psychological condition it is social it is um for example physical barriers yeah it's but it's not physical illness uh, it is caused by the society it's not by its own for example i am being disabled by the society there are some of my rights are being limited that is what disabilities means so that's why i prevent myself from using the word differently able or i can say kelainan upaya because we are we are, we are apa yang lainnya uh, the question will be that uh, what's the difference because we are considered we are considering ourselves as normal we can eat like you guys eat we can drink like you guys drink and we can do the basic needs but there are some of the basic needs that are being they are being being deprived because of the lack of uh, lack of accessibility mm. and sort of there are lots of things actually to discuss but i know that there are quite limitation of things a limitation of time so the based on the presentation i've done earlier that is just a gist of what happening in the society right now there are lots of things actually i see i see thank you thank you for that explanation because we do acknowledge there are different terms out there and we just want to ask um, like what you um, like what you've advocated for always ask uh, persons with disability i guess like uh, the concerns of their community so thank you for that explanation um, um just a follow up question to that um so what can we do to get more people to acknowledge the disadvantages faced by persons with disabilities and make structural changes at a community level okay um the first one i can answer but the second question i would like to ask back <laughs> okay for the first one the thing that we can do because sometimes it's not because of the just want to discriminate us sometimes it's because they don't know they is simply just because because i can say i can share some example with you guys which is um the, we are we we had asked before in the twitter um for example do you prefer the term differently able or disabled the question has been asked to me earlier so sometimes people say okay i prefer differently able because it seems uh, non offensive uh, but it's because they don't know after they receive some explanations from our own community okay oh now i understand why people prefer to be called disabled rather than differently able so the first answer that i can give you is to spread the awareness awareness is very important it is far more important before you can empower the persons with disabilities you have to um and you have to make the society aware make the community aware and for the community level uh, empowerment or community level policy yeah uh, mahira okay for the community level policy what does you mean by community level is it the society structural changes so i guess oh. in policy it can be anything within the system um changes at a community level uh, to make yeah at a community level as a community what should we do to make structural changes so you know we can uplift and also like assist persons with disability okay basically the first thing first is i going to say like i said earlier you need to ask them what they need the first thing of course the second thing is you need to heard what they say yeah. you need to hear what they want what is their needs it's not wants actually it's really their needs 
because the persons with disabilities we have been deprived from our needs and okay for the structural changes how to make the structural changes is very hard actually it, yeah. because our the, okay i can see the social change or the change in malaysia is happening very very slow at a very slow rate hmm. people start just start to gain the awareness and people didn't even know yet what is an accessible uh, ramps for example or an accessible facilities or services so uh, to empower the persons with disabilities and to do the structural changes i would say that we should uh, one thing is we should amend the pwd act lah hmm. uh, but it needs it, i mean we need also the support from the community for us to amend the act because a collective voice is more powerful rather than one person speaking okay that's one thing another thing is basically you try to make the environment as accessible as you can okay i think that's my answer for that question all right thank you so much nasrul um for that perspective and insight we learned so much from that and hopefully as a community we can uplift and assist um persons with disabilities Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Nasrul. Now I'd like to um, pass the floor to. Uh, now I'd like to ask questions uh, for Heng. Uh, there are questions from the floor. Um, he said, um, "Excuse if my question seems silly. I watched Seaspiracy on Netflix, and it seemed like consumption of seafood may cause the death of our planet. So rather than focusing on plastics or recycling or saving the turtles, should we focus on more effort to save our deep ocean?" What are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that it's uh, complicated. Uh, we can, uh, there is no one solution, Sony, because now the global system is broken. So we need different efforts from different uh, stakeholders. Like, um, because uh, I think that what you mentioned in the, uh, the Netflix, the documentary, that is uh, the overfishing, the overconsumption. What we need to do is to rethink, readjust the mechanisms that uh, contribute to the overconsumption because if we said if we can see now like people tend to overconsume overproduce because of the uh, capitalism so what we need to do is to fix the system the broken uh, loophole in the cap uh, in this uh, system like what the solution is to reductions to stop all this unnecessary use for example some people they just overfish it and just throw it and some people they just overproduce all this product and waste it so what uh, all these waste are, uh, I would say like it's, uh, it's, a, it's natural resources. So don't waste waste. Waste is also, it's a, it's a product from natu our natural resources. So um, the problem is like we need to seriously redesign our, uh, rethink our lifestyle. And then for the corporations and governments, they have to redesign the mechanisms that are, which is broken. And everything we seriously cut down our, I mean, our, the, the, the consumption behavior. And uh, because uh, in my presentations, I mentioned that uh, in the next few years, in the next uh, like 10 years, 20 years, the natural resources are de depleting. So we need to be smart how to use our natural resources so that we will not, and at the same time, we need to restore, restore our forests, restore our oceans and protect our existing uh, oceans, existing uh, peatland, existing forests. Then we can let the uh, the natural habitats, the ecosystem, to regrow it, regrow it. Yeah. I see. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Hank, so much for that insight and for that valuable information. I think we can learn from that. Um. So um, I'd like to take more questions. However, um, we are we need to wrap up. We're running out of time. Um, but before we do wrap up, I just want to ask, like, I guess since it's a youth manifesto, apalagi belia mahu. I just I just want to go around um to all speakers that uh uh that is here with us today, like as a youth, like youth manifesto, apa belia mahu in one sentence. Like, what do you think it is? Like, from your perspective, what do you think you want to advocate for? Maybe we can start with Jason. I think for me is beli mahu uh, satu Malaysia yang tidak takut untuk berbincang dan berbahas tentang isu kaum dan agama. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. You, Cheryl. Uh, 
I think uh, the youth want equal access to education uh, that should not be discriminated based on where you live or your demographics, but equal access to quality education for every child in Malaysia. Right. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Nasrul? Okay. All I want or all we want as a youth and as a person with disabilities is please and please and please do heard our voices. That's all. Nice. Thank you, Nasrul. Um, uh, Anis? For me, it would be for there to be equal opportunity, um, non-discrimination, and a safe environment for everyone, regardless of their gender. All right. Thank you, Anis. Um, last but not least, Hang. Mm, I think I think uh, I think that I just uh, quote uh, what the environmentalist Rita Thunberg has said: "Protect, restore, fund, and then we will bring a better future for ourselves." Over. Protect, restore. All right. Um, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I'm sure like all of us learned so much from all of the stellar speakers that we have today. Um, today, um, I guess what we learned from what I personally learned, and I feel like everyone can learn as well, is that like first, I guess, in Malaysia, um, especially in navigating policies, I think we have to ensure conversations happen in a safer, in safe spaces. Um, regardless of any issues. Um, so things like we need to advocate for, such as the repeal of sedition law, maybe it's something that we as a collective should push for to facilitate uh, a safer discussion amongst Malaysia. And we shouldn't be afraid to approach those issues because it can, um, you know, it, we can talk about, not just like about racists or like our communities, but it can also boil down to like things like education, as Cheryl has mentioned, um, even women issues, uh, persons with disabilities, as well as um, climate justice. Um, I guess when it comes to education in Malaysia, uh, the future of education, we do want to induct people, uh, you know, the young Malaysians to not repeat the things that we've probably done. We do want to spark those discussions as young, uh, like our young. So to not be afraid to approach difficult discussions and to navigate it together. Uh, I think that is one that we need to foster. As, but when it comes to law, I think, so this can impact like things like women's, uh, women's rights, as well as persons with disabilities and climate justice. I think uh, what I've seen uh, similar themes is that laws are often ambiguous, and it is not uh yeah it is often ambiguous and it's very difficult for us then to pinpoint what is the problem and if we can define those things that maybe it's easier for us to seek accountability uh from people um we also i guess like what ani said we want equal opportunities and safer environments for these individuals and we if we have these laws enacted maybe we can provide those things and maybe it can be materialized um and as what a natural said um you know we have to, we need to have a mainstream and targeted approach from the presentation that um, he presented uh, just now. Like us as a community, we have to collectivize and work together to help uplift the voices of those that are unheard of. And we need to ensure that, you know, it can, it can manifest in like in structural levels as well as in policy making as well. Um, so yeah, as a community, we need to ensure that those things happen. And last but not least from Heng, um, I remember his um, presentation that says, don't panic, we all have to organize uh, in order for us to have a cleaner and you know, safer environment. We have to liberate ourselves from fossil fuel, capitalism and overconsumption. And that is personally something that I also struggle with and but it is something definitely we need to work towards as a community. So I'd like to thank everyone, um, all the speakers for their presentation and all of the, you know, uh, everyone who attended this um, this 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 forum, I guess, um, and just a reminder that this is a two day event. So, um, I guess like at four p.m. we also have another session with um, I guess like people from different backgrounds, the politicians. Uh, it's something that I also would uh, will attend, and it's super interesting to listen to. We have workshops as well and tomorrow we have another um yeah we have another forum as well as workshops that everyone can attend so do check out midp's uh page um on instagram as well also as well as twitter um so yeah you can access those discussions and we can also you know 
um, put our grievances as well as come together as a community to figure out how do we move forward as a, many, uh, as a community. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Jason, Cheryl, Anis, Nasrul, as well as Heng uh, today. Um, thank you everyone for attending. That's all from us today. Now I'd like to pass the floor to our host, Amelia. Thank you so much, Mahira and all the speakers. Um, can I just quickly request um, that all the speakers um, and Mahira as well, can you please put in the chat box maybe your website or your IG handles or your Twitter handles so that if people want to get in touch, if they want to collaborate, or if they have more questions that are not answered in this session, they can reach out to you. Uh, and hopefully this conversation leads somewhere um, where we can see meaningful change um, can happen. I also wanted to say, I appreciate um, you know, all the, the, the fact that all the speakers talk about how we need to have difficult conversations and to approach this difficult conversation in a way that is most intellectual, in a way that is most um, strategic, that could again lead to change. Um, and no matter how much we disagree with each other, I think it is important to be civil. It is also important to, I guess, um, make sure that the conversation leads somewhere, right? Um, but at the same time, I also want to acknowledge that it's important to call out harmful practices and harmful behavior. All right, cool. Um, so thank you so much, um, everyone, um, for participating. Thank you so much to the speakers for taking time off your busy schedule. Um, I want to say that um, there is um, a survey that we would like to conduct. So please fill in this quick survey. Tell us what you like about this session, what you don't like about this session, we're all ears. And also maybe tell us what you'd like to hear or see from us in the future. I also want to say that, like Mahira reminded you earlier on, there are two more sessions happening today. After lunch, we will have a workshop with Rajvin Pal Singh, the group CEO of Mareka and BGBG Initiative, on addressing injustices through social innovation. And later today at 4 p.m., I will be moderating a hot conversation featuring some of Malaysia's the youngest personalities in the political scene. We have Said Sadiq, we have Shahril Hamdan, Lin Yi Wei, Vanessa, and Prabhakaran, who'll be talking about Mal whether Malaysia will ever be ready for a youth prime minister. I think this is a conversation that you do not want to miss. So thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you on later today. Aside from that, if you'd like to keep updated with our events at MIDP, you can follow our social media at MIDP Today on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We also would like you to invite to join the Taylor's College Rises community. Um, there is a link that you can join. Um, these are free programs that you can join in, um, especially if you're in high school um, or if you're, um, you know, teachers, they have a bunch of awesome free stuff, uh, workshops and events that they organize. Please get in touch with the Taylor's Rises community. There's an app that you can download as well. It's called um, the Rises app. Um, we will put everything in, in a link later on. So thank you so much, everyone. I don't want to take up more of your time. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for showing up and being here. That is all from me today. Amelia Sharif signing off as your host today. Um, see you at 2 o'clock. Bye. <laughs>
Recording stopped.